I'm Angie, and I am an alcoholic. I'd like to thank Gloria and uh, Betty and the committee for inviting me and uh, Dave for getting me a room. <laughs> Since we're giving accolades, I want to thank the women that I sponsor. They came to hear me to make extra points. <laughs> And I want to, with great pleasure, introduce to you my husband, who I 13 stepped. <laughs> he likes for me to say that. I'm in Blythe. You all know where Blythe is? Actually, Richard is why I'm in Blythe. But you know, Richard is such a great guy. We're both dedicated to making me happy. Uh, I have him convinced he never had it so good. And then a woman's place is in the mall. That's what I'm doing in Blythe. If he croaks tomorrow, I'm out of there tomorrow night. <laughs> That's the beginning of my embarrassing him. I wasn't always uh, from Blythe. I, uh, I'm a transplant. I'm really from Orange County. I was born a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I'm really a young person in an old container, and, and I'm a Mexican, in case you didn't know what I was. <laughs> I was born where they kept the mothers in the hospital for a whole week, and they, when they came home with this baby, they, was, uh, they weren't ready for me then, and they were never ready for me actually and uh, I didn't have a name and the reason for that is because my daddy wanted to name me after his girlfriend and my mother's narrow-minded and uh, so I, I had a little trouble feeling like I fit in in that family and uh, I had an older sister that was perfect and uh, she screwed it up for me because I never knew how to be good until after I was bad and they were always whipping on me. I don't know I'm a better child. If I'd have known I was a better child, I'd have held it against them. Guys, I just thought that was the price you pay for not knowing how to be good. They were divorced when I was seven, and my mother would send me to the nuns so they could teach me to be a lady. And what the nuns thought was a lady wasn't appealing to me then, and it isn't appealing to me now. <laughs> In fact, there's a joke going around here about the Easter Bunny, and I started it. And um, I'm not going to tell it, though. They'll throw tortillas at me. <laughs> um, I don't know how to be good, but I also don't. As soon as they said, "Thou shalt not." Well, gosh, I'll start again. I'm Angie, and I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. The reason you can't hear is because I didn't say the joke. <laughs> Do you all know why the, uh, well, uh, <laughs> Do you, do you know why the Easter Bunny hides the eggs? No, why? Because he don't want nobody to know he's been doing it with a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of cleaned it up. <laughs> anyway, don't say thou shalt not, or I'll do it. I have a little problem with that. When I was a little kid, somebody dared me and I never, uh, raised the nun's skirt to see what she wore under all them clothes, and they 86 me from catechism. Because not, uh, not only did I not know how to be good, but as soon as they said, thou shalt not, I had an overwhelming desire to do it, and I wouldn't do it, get it out of my mind till I did it. I mean, this is long before I ever took the first drink. And when I got home, I got my whipping. Like I always got my whipping because I was such an embarrassment to them people. But the next day when I got to school, all the kids thought I was terrific. Man, I got so much attention. I, I'm glad I was born about 50 years before my time because now it's very hard to get that kind of attention. But at that time, I was the only one doing that kind of stuff. And it seems to me that I was born with an emptiness in my soul. There was a yearning, a longing to be loved, to be wanted, to be accepted. The overruling emotion of my life 
as long back as I can remember is I have an emptiness inside of me and hugging myself and just rocking. I don't know what is wrong with me. I don't know why I can't be the way them other people are. And so when I got all that attention, I believe that it filled up some of them empty places. I'm one that believes that I always had the pilot lit. All I ever needed was the fuel. And uh, you know, things were going on in our home. Uh, my mother remarried a man that was getting funny, and, and I went to my mother and I told her, well, looky here. And she said, you're a liar, you always lied. And uh, I felt like a leaf would in a wind, uh, so uh, totally discounted and unnecessary. So I started to do the things, resolve things. You and I have to resolve things the way we resolve them. As a child, the only way I could resolve them is to run away in books and in fantasies and in daydreams. And that's what I did. I used to think if I could only get to my daddy. My daddy was over in the San Fernando Valley, and I used to ache to be with my daddy. If I could only get over there, everything was going to be all right. Now, when I was about 12, I took off to be with my daddy. Now, my daddy was over in the San Fernando Valley where he'd taken up light housekeeping with a lady with eight kids, and all he wants is one more. And <laughs> here I come. And now my daddy used to take people up north to pick grapes and prunes, and we were fruit pickers. And your God made two kinds of Mexicans. That's fruit pickers and non-fruit pickers. And I'm not a fruit picker. They tried to make a fruit picker out of me, and it didn't take it. In fact, you, I've gotten close to a lot of stuff, but work ain't one of them. Uh, Richard knows that, so he says if he ever feels like he's going to croak, he's going to run to the freeway and need a truck so I can get double indemnity in his insurance. I mean, what a deal. So um, he says the only thing I know how to do good is to sit there and be pretty and, and give orders. <laughs> now we stayed beyond the season with the Gallo brothers. I'll tell you what did take. Uh, somebody, they gave my dad a case of sherry wine and somebody must have said, thou shalt not. Because I had a big water glass of that sherry wine and when he went down, he went boom. I mean boom. It felt like I put my finger in the light socket. Man, it was wonderful. <laughs> it's just too bad something that good has to be wasted on social drinkers that don't appreciate it. Man, I loved it. I loved what it did for me, and I knew the next one was going to be better. But I'm a pig from the get-go. I am not a sipper. I'm a chug lugger I mean, I want it in there doing what it's supposed to be, because all I ever wanted was to feel the way I did once I've had that first slug hit my stomach, huh? But because I'm a pig from the get-go and a chug lugger, before you know it, I overshot the goal, and I don't know what happened. I came to the next day, and I told you I was born a long time ago in them Pachuco days, when we used to wear them big hairdos. I, you come to the next day, all that hair all over your face, I go, God! <laughs> Man, it's a terrible feeling, and uh, you drink water and get drunk all over again, and oh, just uh, threw up all over myself and just darn clothes. <laughs> I mean, I knew that there was a magic that happened for me in the bottle, but I also had another friend that came to stay with me. There was a sense of shame of being dirty, knowing I had done something terrible. I didn't know what it was, but I just felt so dirty and so ashamed inside of me. But I don't know how to handle those kind of emotions. The only thing I know is defiance and belligerence. I just put a ball around me and I said, I don't care, I don't care, I don't give a damn. I always had to put that wall around to hide that sensitive, hurt, baffled feeling that I had inside of me. You know, it really wasn't any different every time I drank. I just kept doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. God, what happened? <laughs> My name is Angie, and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> And then I was, let me tell you about the rabbit. <laughs> well, sure, 
shortly after I came back to my mother because I, I didn't like working over there for the Geller brothers. And I came home and my mother said I couldn't come home. And I was just a child. I was 13 years old and I've looked at 13 year old girls today and I was never that young. I always felt unwanted and unnecessary and nobody wants me. My mother said I couldn't come home because they'd been free of me over a year and I was so incorrigible. So I started running the streets, living here and there and everywhere where everybody would put up with me at least for a little while. And I know, don't know how to work. The only work I know how to do is babysitting, and I don't even like kids. And um, I, I'll tell you what I did like. I like, you know, we Mexicans, we like to have them parties for the whole weekend, that if the cops, don't, we don't have any stabbings and shootings, and the cops don't come and lug us away two, three times a night, uh, uh, we ain't had no fun. Yeah. <laughs> I love them parties. I was one of the original topless, bottomless dancers in them parties. I don't even get paid for it. I don't even remember it. So then the girls would tell me what I did, and then I used to beat them up, because violence is the only way I ever handled anything that was embarrassing. The, I was always very popular with the boys, though. I, um, I also don't know how to work, so I take up blur burglary. It seemed to be a good idea at the time. Your things were always much more interesting than mine. I thought you should share. I just borrowed them. I just didn't tell you about it. And uh, I was really surprised when the state of California discovered me. Uh, they didn't understand that my case was different. And so there I took me before a judge, and there sat my mother and all the mother purple lip people. They got purple lip because they're Mexicans, and they're sitting there looking at me. You know how they look at me like I, with that I told you so look in their eye? And, and I look at the judge, and the judge says, well, young lady, what do you think we ought to do with you? Well, at that time, the, the, the uniform was, was fatigues with an army shirt with a collar up. So I put my collar up and slouched down on my chair and says, well, you're the judge. You ought to know, man. And that was a wrong person to have that kind of an attitude with. So he sent me and my editor to do a little bit of time for the state of California. And uh, when I'd, I'm supposed to do nine months, but I don't, I'm a walking bust. I do 13 months. I was so scared. I thought I'd be the only gray-haired little old lady in the girls' reformatory. When they finally let me out, I, got, I was scared. I didn't have a home. I don't have a job. I don't have any education. I don't have any money. And I took my first inventory, and I think, what in order? I can't go through with it. I better go out and find me a husband. And God knows I need somebody to take care of me. So I went out looking for a husband in places that husbands are not to be looked for. And unfortunately for both of us, I found one. There's a certain guy, kind of man that always caught my attention. Usually they got big muscles and tight t-shirts. They walk with a little slouch and they got tattoos. Usually it says, mother, born to lose, and uh, they got greasy hair and shiny teeth and shiny eyes, and they walk with a little jump, don't they? Say, what's happening, baby? Oh, God, it just, today it gives me goosebumps. <laughs> I used to think that look was charisma. Today I know it to be psychosis. <laughs> My sponsor used to tell me you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit, but we tried not to. <laughs> Been apologizing to my kids ever since for the genes we put together. He built them castles in the air, and I lived in them. And three months later, we were pregnant, and I was married in that order. And I married a mainline heroin user, and you just don't live happily ever after with one of those. Very exciting, but not very happy. He had an idea of what a good Mexican wife should be. I had a good idea of what a good Mexican husband should be, and never the twain shall meet. And we got the scars to prove it. I'll tell you what, he wants me to stay home, but I don't stay home silently. He don't don't like for me to talk that way about his mother and his, well, I didn't talk that way about his mother. I talked about his father or lack of or what for, for a four-legged creature. You know, just nice, <laughs> nice. And he would say, shut up or I'm going to hit you. And that sure smacked of thou shalt not. So I used to jump him and hit him first. I did that over and over again. Lost every battle, but I always got 
the first one in. He thought, he thought he was such a bad dude. I always went for his face to scratch his face so that he could go tell the rest of them pachucos what, uh, who let him explain them scratches on his face. <laughs> I would have liked to have that mallet. Um, <laughs> he starts hearing them stories about me and them drunks, and he decides I shouldn't drink. Well, <laughs> I told you I didn't stay home silently, so he introduces me to little white pills with crosses on them. I don't know what they are, but I sure knew what they did to me. I had one eyeball over there and one over there, and I'd make baby clothes all night long. Put it <laughs> Never figure out it was time to put it together, tear it apart, clean your house with a toothbrush, dance with a mariachi, and sing. <laughs> After three days and three nights of this, you just say, for God's sakes, I just want to rest, and your mind says, get up, let's have some fun. <laughs> Once I started taking uppers, I got to take downers. You see, and I felt like I had discovered how to take care of them blackouts. Because there, yeah, there I, I used to take whatever alcohol would balance it out. You know, I got to be really good at it and really busy. Take five of this or three of those. and You're you know, just really good. A slug of that and a slug of that. By the time I had my baby, <laughs> <laughs> it's no wonder both my children are members of Alcoholics and not, I mean, they couldn't miss. <laughs> By that time I had my baby, that put, they put that baby in my arms. I felt like somebody, finally, somebody belongs to me. You see, that man I knew didn't want to be married, and I knew he really didn't want to be married to me because he had promised me so much, and the only reason that he didn't do it is because of the type of person I was. So when they put that baby in my arms, my heart sank. She inspired feelings within me that nobody ever had before. And very few people have since, you see. But I was a child in a woman's body, and I don't know how to be. I would sit by the hour and rock my baby, and I promised her I would never beat her, abandon her, and discard her as I had been, and I meant it with every fiber of my being. If I could have been good for anybody, it would have been that baby. But you see, I'm an alcoholic, and I am a woman alcoholic, and I do what's in front of me to do because it's there to do. I don't know why I do all these things. I it just seems like a good idea at the time, and I never think of tomorrow. It's always take away that madness now, you see. I'll deal for tomorrow for tomorrow. And I took that baby and her sister to places that children should not be taken because I'm an alcoholic. I thought that there was a monster within me. It never occurred to me that alcohol was my problem. It was my answer. I left their daddy after the second one was born because I felt like if I didn't, I couldn't find another one. I was 22 years old and felt older than I do today at 64, don't you know? I was so used up at such a young age. And I went out and I lived as an unprotected bar drinking woman for five years. I know the feeling of degradation and self-loathing that a woman alcoholic goes through when she's alone and unprotected and she drinks in bars. Come to in strange places with strange people to be talked to in ways I don't want to be talked to and put a smile and a ha 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 because I always had to be a ha ha but I died and cried inside all the time. Many a times I would have come home where there was not enough chemicals to kill what I had in the cold water shed. That when I would turn the lights on, the sink would be black with cockroaches, and there was mice on the filthy floor, and in that shack lived two little girls, that the romance of being a mother had long since died. And the responsibility for, for them choked me, you see. They were little girls with the big eyes that didn't know how to laugh and didn't know how to play. They would argue in their whispers because they were terrified that the monster would come to and start screaming and yelling, and then I would start hitting. And once I started hitting, it was like I, I was looking at me, and I could say, for God's sake, stop, stop. And I couldn't stop, and I wouldn't stop until there were screams and prayers uh, and beggings. And a semblance of sanity would return. 
And I would say to myself, for God's sakes, look what you're doing to the little girls. I knew I was destroying them. I just couldn't stop. I've heard many women come into the program and they say that they've taken away their children and they're very sad. But in those days, I wished there was some place I could have given, given those little girls to so they could have a chance in life. I'm not telling you this uh, because I'm proud of it. I'm telling it to you because it happened. And somehow it's in the talking, in the sharing, that I have been able to forgive myself from the tremendous guilt of what I did to my children. So in freeing me, I hope that you will give yourself permission by hearing me to forgive yourself. Because I know the mothers of Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a hard time not taking responsibility for our children's behavior later in life. After five years of this, you know I fell and kept falling in love. It seems to me I've always been in love. And when I fall in love, I fall in love all over my body forever. I, yeah, you know the. I just, I don't fall in love, I take hostages. Yeah, that, that word was really coined well for us, at least it was for me. And um, this guy got tired of me trying to kill him. I always wanted to kill him. I, they only behaved, I wouldn't try to kill him, but they never wanted to behave. And I got started getting letters through the mail from my dope fiend husband that was someplace in Texas getting the care. And he had, you know, there's nothing like the dope fiend when they clean up, they start pumping iron and eating good, looking good, send pictures home and says, babes, this time it's going to be different. So we made the Mexican Geographic. We moved about 30 miles from Mama. First he... <laughs> First, he wants to stop me from drinking. Now, can you believe this? And I, um, I don't cooperate, so he knifes me. And uh, then I carried a gun, and uh, then he calls up and says, uh, I'm sorry. So, you know, he wouldn't have knifed me if he didn't love me. So we ran off to Las Vegas to get married. <laughs> Nobody ever accused me of being well. <laughs> anyway. We, uh, we were going to be like everybody else. We joined the PTA, bought a little ranch with the chickens and the turkeys and the horses, and we were going to be farmers, this dope fin and I, and uh, joined the PTA and all that good. Married him in the Catholic Church. I mean, just good, all kinds of good things, especially since he was a Methodist, you know. I was <laughs> going to make him happy whether he killed him or not. If he didn't, I'll ki I always could kill him. And, uh, but it isn't long before. What happened is he makes a pass at my neighbor, and I went and beat her up, and and the cops came, I found out you're not supposed to do that to them nice Anglo ladies. So, um, the best, yeah, Blythe has been called the armpit of California, but uh, if you ever know about Miraloma, it's a, another part of the anatomy not worth mentioning. At least that was my experience there. Something happened. The best thing I can say about, about Mira Loma, it was in the middle of four wineries. I mean, I used to go and buy five gallons. Don't ask me why five gallons. I just knew that I had to get enough to, have made, to not to have to go make the run every day. I just would go and make the run, come home, go to bed. Make, get up, go make the run, come home and go to bed. And something happened to my drinking at that time, it changed. Where before I had been a party girl, I'd been a, a, a good time girl, the, the booze and the boys and the cha-cha-cha. Now all I wanted to do was drink by myself. I ran off everybody that was near and dear to me. Everybody that was coming and telling me how should be, how I should be, I always knew how to be. But nobody ever told me how to get from here to there, you see. And so that I would abuse everybody that come to me around me, and I pushed them off. This is a time when I know what the word agony, despair, and utter loneliness. I know those words. I know what it is to drink all the fun of the bottle and lay in my bed in a fetal position and cry out and cry out in agony. To come in agony to come to the place in my drinking where I drank and I drank and my body's drunk and my mind's in agony and I can't drink and I can't be sober and I just want to die. 
I want to die so desperately that the day came when I made a decision to kill myself. But I couldn't bring myself to kill myself and let them little girls find me. This man came home one day because he was out doing his stuff too. He came home one day and he was watching television and I, and I told him I was going to kill myself and he said, all right. And we had a, a slight communication problem and uh, I went and took a bath. Do you know what that means when I tell you that I went at home and took, that I took a bath, that I cleaned my house and put on clean clothes? I hadn't done that. I just did it because just in case I died, they wouldn't know how I lived. And when I came to a couple of days later, I was not glad to be alive. I couldn't drink and I couldn't be sober and I couldn't live and I couldn't even kill myself. I was a failure at even that. I came to and what has got to be the loneliest day of my life when I realized this man had been in, in bed with me both nights while I was in that coma and never once did he consider taking me for any help. But I, when I would sink into a pit of self-pity uh, for a long, long time after that when I would think upon that day until I realized that even on that day, my higher power has had, he always had his hand upon my life. Because that very day there was a knock on the door, is a lady from the PTA. If there's somebody I didn't want to see, it's a lady from the PTA. <laughs> and there stood Mrs. Clean, said, hi. I must have been downwind from her because she said, what is wrong? You know, I had been in the same clothes that I was in for two days and two nights and come to in my own filth and didn't even have what it took to go clean up. And she came in and, you know, this clean lady, she stayed with me and cleaned me up. And I don't know how you are, but I'll tell you how I am. I got a big mouth. I got a kind of mouth that I can talk and talk about half hour before my brain finds out what I said. <laughs> and uh, 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 usually I, I, I don't get offended when people get a kind of a glazed look in their eye. That doesn't offend me. But I'll tell you that that's all right. That's kind of normal. But this lady who had that glazed look and all of a sudden she had a bright look in her eyes. That's when I go, uh-oh, because I know that I've talked too long then. And that's what happened to that lady. She, she came to and she says, have you ever heard of Al-Anon? I've never heard of Al-Anon. But I got the idea that if I went there, he would straighten up. So she got me clean up and, and took me to Al-Anon. And somehow I didn't fit in in Al-Anon. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I felt a little bit like a whore would in a nunnery. There was absolutely no identification between me and them square broads, but I smiled at them. I had that, that you know, that the lights are on, but there's nobody home smile. Some place along the line I had uh, heard that I had a beautiful smile. Probably some guy that wanted more in my smile. But uh, anyway, at this time, I just smiled at him. And, and I don't know what was going on there. I know they hugged me and they prayed. I had been having some spiritual experiences by that time, taking all the junk I was taking inside of me. So I thought God had sent me to save those ladies. I, I, hardly, I hardly ever say that because it sounds embarrassing. <laughs> After a while, I don't want to go there. This lady keeps dragging me over there. And uh, one day I heard the word release, so I call, came home and told him in detail how I was going to release him. So he used to sleep with his clothes on and a knife under the pillow, and I would sit in the corner with a big black coat on and watch him. As he'd be a dozy enough, I'd go take a little peek at him. He'd go, oh, God, I love that. <laughs> it was almost sexual. It felt so good, you know? And he would say unkind things to me. He would say, baby, I may have a monkey on my back, but you got an orangutan. I thought, how dare he? And one day I came home and he was gone. He took everything with him. He wasn't planning on coming back. And that's the way it had to be. Though that life was unbearable, it was familiar. And you know, I'd have killed him. Or I forced him to kill me. Because sometimes the madness would be so incredible that the only relief I got was with physical violence. And those of us that know about that, know about that. And because bad luck comes in bunches, it was at that time they threw me out of Al-Anon. 
And they, they designated this poor soul that had inflicted me upon them to throw me away to their husbands who they didn't like either. Because they found out there was a fraud among them. <laughs> so she came and cleaned me up and took me to an A&A meeting in Pomona on, 1960, on August of 1964. It was a long time ago, but I remember this lady cleaned me up and took me to an old dilapidated old house in Pomona, and she took me around through the back because I'm a Mexican, and walked me through the kitchen where all them al are standing around the kitchen doing whatever al do in the kitchen, Ooh, and, and I knew they were all going to look at me, so I am not giving them the pleasure of me seeing the contempt and disgust and triumph that them normal people ever had, always had with me. So I just looked at my feet and walked through them ladies, and I walked into a room where I listened to the sounds of Alcoholics Anonymous. Something happened to me. The very first time I came to you, I loved how I felt with you. There was laughter. I listened to that belly laughter, that smile that reaches the soul, that shine in the eyes, and that happy talk. And those are the sounds of Alcoholics Anonymous that I heard. It was the music of Alcoholics Anonymous that was the attraction for me. It was not the words. I don't know what you're talking about. But I listened to you. It had been so long, so long, if ever, that I had been able to have that belly laughter, you see. I just looked to sit back there and let it wash over my soul. And I wanted what you had. I just thought, it's too bad I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> if there's another name for the disease that you and I have, it's called, I ain't got it. Now, I know I'm weird, and I know I'm different, and three steps ahead of the men with the butterfly nets. But that was, that was okay with me. But I just didn't think I was an alcoholic. I used to be an alcoholic. When I was a kid, I was an alcoholic. But I cured it with Benzedrine. I just hadn't found the right combination. So I just sat back there. Newcomer, if you be like Lucky like me, I hungered for it. I sat back there and let it wash over my soul. I looked around at all them sober, single, good-looking young guys, and I said, I'm going to get me one of those. And I did. It was the sickest one. There it had to be. I got radar. But it takes what it takes, and that's what it took for me. My higher power knew what would catch my attention. And for 10 months, I came all, uh, to Alcoholics Anonymous as a visitor. In Pomona, in those days, I went around the room, and when it came to me, I'd say, I'm Angie, and I'm a visitor. I'm not an Al-Anon. They kicked me out of Al-Anon, and I'm not an alcoholic. I might be a little, like, po something like potential. So I'm saying, I'm Angie, and I'm a visitor. Nobody ever said you don't belong here. Somehow you understood I've been kicked in the teeth by life and rejected by everybody I come in contact with, and I I couldn't have stood any more rejection. You put your arm around me and said the most important words that you and I have to say to one another. You said, keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. Do you know what that feels like when you're used to people saying, keep on going, weirdo? <laughs> it was really a disappointment to me when I found out you were telling that to everybody. <laughs> I just thought it was me. <laughs> I'm feeling a little guilty around you, so I stopped drinking and doubled up in the Milton's and Ben's a drink because that's what was getting it. And I got weirder, you know. I, there's something about us that gets really weird. <laughs> uh, drinking just kind of balances us out. And uh, I try to, this guy ain't behaving, so I try to kill him. And they don't like to be killed. He wants to get rid of me, and I'm not easy to get rid of because I don't have a backup. So I moved to Pomona to be closer to the action. And I walk into a room one day, and there's this cute little boy sitting there with blue eyes and blonde hair, and I have an affinity for blue eyes and blonde hair. Today, today it is blue eyes and gray hair, because time she does march on. <laughs> and he's talking, and he, he says, he don't have a surfboard, he don't have a car. And I think to myself, come here, little boy, I'll take care of you. <laughs> 
I and I did, and he thought a Mack truck hit him. Boy, I'll tell you what, I educated him on sick women. Uh, but after that relationship was over, he decided to become a minister, and I'd like to think that somehow, in my small way, I helped push him over to God. <laughs> He was, he was the first man that had ever been kind to me. He was the first man that had ever been gentle with me. And everywhere that he went, he wanted to take me with him. Me that had always been abused and misused by every man that I'd ever been with. And I'd have stayed there forever, you see, because I held on with a death grip. Do anything, do anything you want to me. Just don't leave me. The terrible fear of abandonment. I know today that you and I do not come together by accident. I truly believe we come together by divine appointment. And yet every relationship has its beginning and its parting. Every relationship. The only relationship that keeps on growing is a relationship that I hold with my higher power today. But in those days, I didn't know that. I just held on with a death grip. I had another drunk in me. I am one, like my sponsor said, I'm the one that had to go out and remove all doubt. There's only one good drunk in every alcoholic, is the one where you drink all the fun of the bottles. I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous desperate. I've often said you don't have to be desperate to stay sober. It just helps. I am one that has had to be beat down to my knees in order to know what it is to have serenity. The miracle for me is not that I came back to Alcoholics Anonymous. The miracle for me is that I am still here and that last December the 22nd, I celebrated my 32nd birthday. That is the miracle for me. And the victory is not mine, and the sobriety is not mine, and the miracle is not mine. I am a product of the people, of them old timers. They came to carry the message to me. That I am the product of Alcoholics Anonymous. The miracle is Alcoholics Anonymous, not me. Because I have known people that have long sobriety, that have gone out again, and what happens to the miracle? No, as long as I continue to fulfill the conditions of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I get to shine as part of the miracle here, don't you know? I came back here, and in the beginning, they all knew more than me. God, there was a step up for me to be called an alcoholic from, a, from some of the things I'd been called. Uh, I don't know if I wanted what you had. I just couldn't stand what I had. That's as simple as that. I just couldn't stand what I had, and I became teachable. Uh, uh, there were things, that, there were heroes here. I had my hero. My hero was Johnny Harris. Johnny Harris, even though there's a lot of people that uh, say that, that perhaps this, that, and the other, but I'll tell you what, he jump-started the love of Alcoholics Anonymous inside of me. He's the one that told me that every woman that comes into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous automatically uh, be, uh, is treated like one, and uh, I will learn to be one here. He told me that the answers to all my problems throughout my sobriety, throughout my life, were in between the covers of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, that I didn't have to live that way anymore if I didn't want to, you see. And he, uh, I listened to him. I listened to him because he said this in such a way that it spoon-fed my soul. It spoon-fed my soul. Now, uh, um, the day came when I resented a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I know there's nobody that crass, but uh, I resented <laughs> the way this guy looked and talked. And, I mean, everything about him I resented. And I'd go uh, uh, to some of you and I'd ask you, how do you get over resentments? And they say, turn it over easy, does it, this too shall pass. One day at a time, go home, read the book, keep coming back and don't drink. <laughs> After a... <laughs> I, I didn't have a sponsor. The group was 
Well, just because I was sober. I don't like them old, uh, young women because them older women, we got a lot of time because they look at you. I don't know what they're seeing, but I know they're seeing something because I could see it in their eyes so I stay clear away from them. Then I don't like them young women. I'm glad there weren't that many because I still got that young guy and I'm a, like a monkey with a monklet. <laughs> but the guys are always so friendly. <laughs> <laughs> So I put my smile, remember, I said, how would he get over his illness? And, and I, I didn't want to go back to you because, you know, I was a dummy, so I'd go to somebody else. And again, I'd say, turn it over. He does it this to shall pass one day at time. Go meet the book. We're coming back and don't drink. After a while, I got the message. You don't know the answer either. I just, <laughs> but I just keep doing that stuff so you won't find out that I'm a fraud among you too. So, uh, yeah. Uh, one day, we're the... Somebody had told me, say, the serenity prayer. This guy had the serenity prayer said for him 10,000 times in a meeting. It was just incredible. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like the ro- rosy. <laughs> and that's what I was doing when he started talking. And then all of a sudden, I stopped because he's crying. God sakes, he's crying and how embarrassing. Has any ever heard of John Wayne, Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata? Somebody, for God's sake, he's crying. Women and sisters cry. Oh, yeah. After the meeting, they all went and hugged him. I said, oh, hell. That's not what I said. It just sounds a little better. I, I didn't feel like hugging him, so I went and gave him one of them stiff arm eyes, you know, just one of those just in case what he had was contagious. What I had was bad enough. I went and gave him one of them stiff arm eyes. He ain't got no class. He just comes right in and sl- slobbers on my shoulder. <laughs> But something happened. The pain in him reached out and touched the pain in me. Because certainly I had known pain like he was feeling, you see. And that was the beginning of the language of the heart for me. And all that anger, all that resentment, all that yucky feelings that I revolved that I had for this man melted as if it had never been. And the love that you had showered upon me somehow or another had taken hold. And I held this man, and I meant it. And I truly believe that is the first time I ever had a feeling for another person. Ah, when I came to this program and I was with you, I still felt like I was behind a glass wall. There was all you, and then there was me. And because, like uh, Dan, Dan said last night, that we will be rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence, the likes of which we had not even dreamed, that I truly believe that it was at that moment that I belonged here that I am, that I could finally say to my innermost self, I am an alcoholic, and I belong here. I belong here, and it's never been any different. Everywhere that I go, that there's a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, where there's you and I come together, I belong here. It has filled up my soul one day at a time. You see, I am one of those people that is just very difficult to, be, to trust. I can believe, but I, that I believed that my higher power would keep me sober. But there were other areas of my life that needed a little bit more footwork. And what I did is I married that young guy. A lady had volunteered to be my sponsor. And uh, she told me I had to give up that young guy or one day he'd give me up. I had to stay home and learn to be a mother and, or else my kids would grow up and be horrible. And uh, I'd never been able to, to live without somebody holding. I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about somebody that I cherish me, hold me close and make that lonely, horrible something go away at least for a little while. And my kids don't like me any more sober than I did when I was drinking. We had horrible fights. Uh, sober. Uh, one time I came home, there was sugar on the floor, and I got the hairspray, threw it on the floor, it bounced up, broke the sliding glass door, the cat jumped out, ran away. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I think I was sober at that. I don't know how long. And my children, my daughter, when I say this, she says, yeah, the cat ran away because he could. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, they don't stick the knife and twist it. 
So I did the most reasonable thing for me. I gave up the sponsor. She made me feel guilty. <laughs> I married that young guy and started going to women's stag meetings. Got a sponsor. She was, I, I'm, I need experts, so I got the, the queen sponsor. You know the queen sponsor? <laughs> That's the one that talks to you and stuff. You don't even know what she's talking about. You say, yes, ma'am. Yeah, you're right, yeah. I always used to manufacture a little uh, stuff to, so she could sponsor me over. And uh, what she used to say, dear, you are so good at waving the red herring. I thought it was a compliment. Till I found out what that means. <laughs> I never was one that took much of a, uh, my, um, that didn't take much of a hint anyway. You yeah, hit me with a Mack truck and married that young guy, and I was, I was always scared that my kids were going to grow up the way I did. Well, the time came when my higher power said, It's time, it's time. My kids got big and started drinking and taking drugs. You know, the children of the 60s, you know what that means. <laughs> Drug, sex, rock and roll, that kind of stuff. Well, <laughs> I knew it was all my fault, and I tried to correct them, and they wouldn't correct, and uh, I came home one day, they were so loaded, we had a big fight, I hit them, they hit me back, and they ran off. I, I hated my mother, only went 20 miles, I went to Ohio, God, I don't even know any Mexicans in Ohio, <laughs> and the other one went to live in a commune and came home one day with a burn the size of a silver dollar in her chest, where people had been putting cigarettes out on, and I died inside. Here I was, the best me I'd ever been. I was sober like five years and everything was between my fingers. I had everything I, that I had planned that would make me happy and it wasn't it either. I went into a terrible depression and again I contemplated an attempted suicide. That young man went and took me to the psycho ward, went home, packed his clothes and left. And everything that I ever feared came about because you see my higher power did not spare me for the bondage to another human being again. And the reason I stand before you tonight is because my higher power has given me a gift, a gift of sobriety and a talent. I don't know, passing it on maybe, passing it on. Not caring what I tell you from the podium. It isn't important. The only thing I am is a messenger anyway. God ain't got much class on who he uses for messengers anyway. <laughs> So all I got to do is be me. I uh, made peace with my higher power. I said, okay, God, I'm never going to be happy again. All you ever want me to do is work with the sick women drunks. Let them puke on me. All right, all right. It, I got sober in Toesburner country. You know, Toesburner country is Claremont. Women there, I don't think they ever got off of their bedrooms, but uh, it was them women that came around me that taught me how to be a lady, you see. And in here we become each other's mamas. I never had any really good communication with my mother. She died and I just never could quite, we couldn't quite mesh. But it's from the women in Alcoholics Anonymous that have rocked me and mothered me. That, I, uh, that we'd become each other's mamas here and you taught me to be a lady. I had to move so I moved back to Orange County and I threw myself completely and absolutely into this program, never knowing I'm never going to be happy again. I said, okay, God, all you ever want me to do is work with the sick women drunks and let them puke on me. All right, all right. <laughs> so I threw myself into this program, and God, I don't know about your higher power, but mine has a weird sense of humor. When I want something so bad, oh, God, this just this one time, just this one, ten Hail Marys, ten Our Fathers, ha, ha, ha. It don't come. As soon as you say, ah, screw it, here it comes. I don't know why it works that way, but it does. <laughs> when I got to the other side, you know there's another side that you have to go through. That I, I had to go the part, through the part where I wanted to uh, shoot him in the belly, put booze in his coffee, running down the freeway back and forth. It was flat like a tortilla. My, my sponsor assured me that he would lock you up for being crazy, only for acting crazy, and that if God removed all my character defects, I disappear. But when I got to the other side, I touched a power and a strength that was way down inside of me. And I knew that nothing and nobody could ever own me again. Because I found out way down inside of me one Sunday morning that after all that's said and done, there's only you and me, God, anyway. 
that the closer that I hold, the tighter that I hold, that it is called smothering, and they can hardly wait to, to leave me, you see. That's why they left me, because I, di I didn't want their breath. I just wanted their bone marrow. I mean, what's wrong with that? <laughs> And I started working with the, with the women. You know, I, I, I started going to recovery houses and picking them up and taking to me. They thought I cared. I didn't care. I just doing it because I'm supposed to do it, not because I cared. I had brought them to my house, gave them money, and well, I had a lady come up to me. Do you remember when I said I didn't remember? I didn't care. I just did it because I'm supposed to do it. And, but God throws in the joker someplace along the line. I found out when I do those things for you, one day I care. I didn't know where that came from. And by my caring for you, felt exactly the way I thought you loving me would feel. It is what filled up all them empty places. To be able to get up here to a podium and talk about my life has healed my soul. To be able to share with you another woman and watch the lights come on for the love and acceptance that you have shown me, that's what has filled up all the empty places, you see. I lived alone for nine years, lady. Do not get discouraged. I kissed a thousand princes and turned them into toads. I don't know what happened. I knew that as soon as I kissed a nice guy, all of a sudden he would turn into a selfish, self-centered, taking person. I don't know how I, I always did that magic. And so I knew that one day at a time, I don't drink because I'm an alcoholic. One day at a time, I don't steal because my sponsor wouldn't let me. And one day at a time, I didn't get married because there ain't life after marriage, you see. And now. Uh, I had another opportunity to find out where I was. What happened is that my sister, who had always been held up as an, as an example for me, chose to take her life. And it was my destiny to be the one to find her. And there was a touch that my higher power put in my life. And all I can tell you is that if you've had it, you know what I'm talking about. I was touched by my higher power on that day before she killed herself. And something came together. I called you and my dear friend, Irish Annie came. I don't know, for those of you that know her, know she's my sobriety sister in every sense of the word. She came and hugged me and walked through me. But something came together that said, God is the only giver and the only taker of life. She chose to go and he let her go home. How many times did I want to die? Life was never what I wanted. I always felt that those that died got to go. Life was what I was scared of, not, uh, not dying. But at that time, I realized that it was removed from me, just like every other defect of character that I look back and has been removed from my path, not removed from my existence, but removed by my path is only the result of doing something else, doing the steps and doing the service, and it comes. And I realized at that time that I had been spared because I am God's melody alive, and he sings his song through me. He sings his song through me. Someplace, somewhere, somebody needs to hear and the places I come from and know that we belong here. Two weeks after that, I became a grandma. I never knew how to be a, mo a mother, but I knew how to be a grandma from the get-go. The only problem with that is too bad they get to be teenagers <laughs> and uh, uh, get to have an uh, alien takeover uh, uh, when they become teenagers. And, uh, it was at that time I was working in a hospital as a counselor. And I started wanting to stay home and clean my house. You know, it wasn't just come home, uh, get ready, and go out to a meeting. I went to meeting all the time. I love going to meetings. I love speaking in it. I like hearing it. I just love Alcoholics Anonymous. And one Monday, my sponsor said, one day you will fall in love with probably some inmate from in here. <laughs> I said, not me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, well, what can I tell you? Uh, I fell in love with a with a newcomer and if it offends any of your spiritual giants, it sure offended me, but uh, at least he went home and, and called me about the program and I talked to him about the program and 
And well, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, I didn't want to, I was a, kind of a, ashamed that a spiritual giant like me would be. <laughs> anyway, I took him to a, I was speaking at a convention in Ventura where I didn't think anybody would know me. And he came with me, and here comes Frank Sloan, of all people, you know. If I'd known Frank since, since he's sitting over there. <laughs> Raise your hand, Frank. Yeah, that. I'd known Frank since 1972, and here we're talking about 79. And um, yeah, here's, oh, Jesus, and I'm trying to hide this guy, you know, and he don't hide too good. And, Frank's coming, he looks at him and looks at me and says, is she with you? And I, oh, yeah. And he says, you see one of us? Well, he sees his nose is still red and his eyes are, are spinning and his head's going like them little Mexican dogs in the Mexican cars, you know, they're going. <laughs> and Frank says to me, for God's sake, Sandy, give that poor guy, how long has that guy been sober? I thought, but no man. He says, for God's sake, give that poor guy a break. Let him get sober first. <laughs> it hurt my feelings. So I went to my sponsor. I said, Mary, go, go, go. Because I love to whine. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Angie, he's a nice guy. If you don't want him, I'll take him. Well, <laughs> Tell him you scooped him in before somebody else does. <laughs> and if you're afraid somebody's going to find out something about you, just tell them. <laughs> and then you won't be af afraid. You won't be afraid, you see. Because it is the secrets that you and I hold with one another that makes those walls come out. And I don't know how you are, but if I have one secret with one, then I've got to have ten secrets with another, and pretty soon I don't belong here. Or, or you're too good and I'm too bad. You see, it isn't that way. I'm so glad that we don't have to be well here. The only people that are well, I guess, are the ones that are dead or, or drunk. Or the rest of us just keep stumbling forward. My sponsor always told me, you just try a lot of things that don't work to find the ones that do. I am just so grateful that, that today, uh, uh, Richard and I have been married 17 and a half years. He, isn't that great? Yeah. He's a, he's a great husband. He came one day with his, he's a first we, he was so fascinating. I was fascinating fascinating for me. He was the first man that ever wore cowboy hats all the time. And and those pointed shoes and wore the belt buckles and had horses and all that stuff. And he'd been raised in, in New Mexico with them New Mexico Mexicans. He knows how to speak Spanish better than I do. And and he'd never seen a Mexican like me before. So we were just super fascinating with each other, I guess. And he came over with his cattle uh, truck and put all my tiliches in orange, and I went off to Blight to be happily ever after. <laughs> well, they didn't do it very good in Blight. They didn't, they weren't aa ain't it very good in Blight, and I'm not very silent either, so I ran them all off, and uh, they were not kind to me. But my sponsor became the one, uh, she's my champion. She said, Angie, you're not here to win a popularity contest. You're there to stand up for the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what you're there for. This program is to be passed on as what was given to you. If this program is a miracle, and the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is a miracle, the center of our miracle, then it needs no changing, and it needs no fixing, you see. And I truly believe that. I tell you both my children are sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. And it is great. I had to let my children dump them poison on me. They had all that anger and all that hurt that they had to eat since they were little girls. And it's great to be able to tell them, yes, I did it to you. Yes, they dumped it on me. And we hugged and we cried. And I said, whether I give it to you through genes or through your environment, I did it to you, but the recovery is yours, and I can't pay for it anymore. I am through paying for it, you see, and you need to, for your own, for your own, to, to need to take inventories to finally get to know that it takes every minute and every inch of everything we experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to get to where we are today. And it's great to have be friends with my children, 
my children can can even tell dirty jokes together now. Like the one, uh, like Lorraine, that can say to me, yeah, the good cat left only because he came good. You know, that kind of stuff uh, is great between my daughters and I. Uh, and uh, my sponsor died 10 days ago. My sponsor had been my sponsor, Mary Regan, for over 22 years. And I loved her, and I felt safe with her, and she loved me. When I found out she had terminal cancer, I called her, and I knew she was sick because she let me come see her. She, I never knew how old she was till it came out in the obituary because she was... She wouldn't tell me, told me it was none of my business. And I said, can I bring you anything? Yes, she said, yes, bring me some perfume, but don't bring me any of that Mexican loud perfume. Bring me something soft. And she said, and bring me some Snickers. Uh, don't bring me them big Snickers. I want them little, little Snickers. So I bought her that nice, I told her some, some guy, probably some fag, she said. You know how, she, you know you, that new Mary Reagan, you? I said, some good looking guy. She said, yeah, she said, probably some fag. <laughs> not that she was, anybody that knew her knew how she was, and not that she was ever against anybody. But, uh, and she said, and did you bring the Snickers? And uh, so there were the Snickers. And she didn't want him for herself. She wanted to be the, the grand dame. You know, the grand, passing out the Snickers to the nurses and the orderlies and everything. <laughs> and I got to hug my sponsor, and the last word she said to me is that, Angie, you are my best friend in the whole wide world. And I called her, this was Wednesday, and I called on Friday, I sent her some flowers. I wanted them to give her an orchid. And I said, you are the best. So I called her Friday, and she said, I said, did you get the flowers? Oh, she said, they're the most beautiful flowers. And she always says that. And uh, she said, but I don't have any more Snickers. And I, I said, I can't bring you any more Snickers. How about C's candy? She said, no, I don't want C's candy. I want Snickers. And I thought, what, I hung up and said, what does she know? So I called up C's and they couldn't deliver them soon. So I had, went to Smart and Final and bought a big bag of Snickers, cost me $6, and, and I mailed them overnight mail for $20. I said, there you are, Mary Reagan. <laughs> I'll tell you, I was faithful to the end, and I love my sponsor, and she will always be with me. Thank you so much for having me.